kind of uh, tongue-in-cheek selection today. It's Clark Terry's No Problem. <laughs> but let me tell you, we in fact do have a problem. We're not yet ready with our phones. So we will continue because uh, what I have to say is worth listening to, I think, as preparation for our coming discussion. So the phones are not, I'm not able to take your phone calls, but I know you can hear me, and that's good. As you know, we have moved, and uh, the innards of our station uh, have moved along with everything else, and it takes some time to not only install, but to assemble and reassemble and test and retest. So... We just have a little further to go, and we'll be all right. So bear with us, please, as we are not able, you and I, to connect the way we normally do, which is to have a running back and forth going. So we'll delay that only by a couple of days. Uh, Certainly by Monday, I'm told, we should be in good shape. So hang in there until we get ourselves straightened out, until the phone company figures out how to get us up and running. Okay, but that's Clark Terry's uh, uh, No Problem. It's from his 1960 album, Color Changes. And I'm returning now to our ongoing discussion, which has to do with reclaiming, rebuilding, reconstructing, our sense of community. Why? Because I'm making the case that it is critical to our survival. If we don't have community, we have nothing. And we're headed, unfortunately, in that direction, but there is still time for us to turn this particular thing around because it is so essential to our collective security and our collective survival. I mention this because, as we see the way things are going, more and more the message being sent to us is, this really doesn't concern you, especially people of color, working class people. What is happening now in America really doesn't concern you. This is a a game, a political game, a power game they're playing among themselves. They don't have to tell us we're not invited. (laughs) They don't have to tell us we have no part to play in this. They're just continuing with their shared agendas. We would be crazy, especially now, we would be crazy to buy into the myth that we always are sold that we are part of this great experiment called American democracy, where we all share equally in the building and 
and maintenance and the, 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 the largesse of our country. It, we start hearing these possessive pronouns we, we don't often hear, like we and ours and our. We don't hear these things very often. But you'll hear them now as we get closer to the presidential election of 2020. But presidential election or not, we certainly should take stock and we certainly should conclude that we're in very bad shape. I don't mean collectively we're in bad shape. There are people who are doing better than they've ever done before, better than their forebears have done by factors of 10 and 20 and 30 and 40 and up. They're doing very, very well. They control the essential operations of government. And they have brought with them a renewed dedication to greed and class warfare. And although they may not express it this way, it's their time to reclaim the country and to reshape the country so that it resembles as closely as possible the original plan. And we don't have to discuss the original plan. The original plan was no good. Certainly not for the vast majority of Americans. And everything suggests that that is, in fact, the ultimate plan to return the country to the way it was, as if that is progress. We see how they are tending to their interests. They may differ with each other on uh, little points or even big points. Like, where should we start the next war? You know, who else should we... Uh, impose sanctions on? What is the order? Who will come first in the sanctions department? They will differ on these things. How do we allocate the budget? Where would we spend the people's money? Well, Trump already just, he just answered that question. He and his family, presumably, I think, at taxpayer expense, just had a state visit with the queen. Now, here's an example of what I mean, where there, there's a whole new attitude, a, a new sense of power, of what people in power can and can't do. You're the president of the United States? Okay. But since when does a state visit involve every member of your family? It's called a state visit for a reason. The head of state and in this case his wife, the first lady, are understood to be the guests of the queen. Not his sons, not his daughter, not his son-in-law. They're not at all involved in running the state, so far as we know. They have no executive positions in this government. But there they are. In your face. They're telling us you may not approve of us as having anything to do with the state. But guess what? We think we are deserving of that right. So we took it. 
You see what I mean? I mean, for shame, even just for shame's sake, you wouldn't want to be so obvious about your covetousness and your greed and your lack of diplomacy and your insult to your own nation, let alone your host nation. The queen didn't invite Ivanka Trump. She's not a head of state. But you see, they think they're heads of state. And so they behave that way, whether we like it or England like it, likes it or anybody else. It doesn't matter to them. This is what they're doing. And you can be sure that even as I speak, they're trying now because there must be some kind of backlash about this business of finding that this state visit includes the president's grown children and their spouses and at whose expense? Do you think these people will dole out money? No. Do you think it concerns them, the obvious conflict of interest here? And it's the thing that is really profoundly insulting to you and me. You take your two grown sons, marginally competent even by your own admission, but they are the people who are running your real estate business. I mean, for manners sake and to cover up your greed and your tracks and your propensity to criminal conduct. Don't you think for this one occasion in the, in the sense that you're meeting the queen an avowed world power, unlike you, you think it was necessary to show the world your behavior as if we can't form the logical line of reasoning from that. Your sons are with you. They run your real estate empire. And this so-called state visit is a good way to begin business negotiations and make contacts. That's how they think of it. They don't understand or appreciate what a state visit is about. And they don't care that the president of the United States, in this sense, is a figurehead. He is a representative of the country. He's not there to strike deals. At least this is our, our uh, assumption. But look how crass that is. Who paid for them to go there? You know, these people with all the money they have, they have all this money because they spend other people's money. And there is your, your secretary of the treasury since when is he a head of state? What is he doing there? So in all these ways, because they are not thinkers, and even if they do think, they don't think that deeply, that people will be offended at this president's conduct, that you will choose as a guest of the queen to behave in your customarily slack way, money grubbing, always thinking about what you could do for money, even it, if it insults the sensibilities of the vast majority of people. So I'm asking the question. This is something that ought to be answered. Who paid for Trump's entourage who were unnecessary and who were not invited? 
How is it that the president's sons and his daughter and her husband and one of his uh, son's wives, that they get to enjoy benefits that don't accrue to them? And on our dime. Now, people may think I'm being picky. But I'm saying this is the attitude of this president and his entire entourage. They all think like that. Let me see how we could make a, a penny, even if it is, is insulting, even if it is shameful, even if it goes against protocol. They don't have any respect for that. But they demand that we must respect the law. We must respect protocol and all this nonsense. You see, this is what I'm talking about. They are living by their own rules. We are crazy to believe that we also should live by their rules. And the time has come for us to make a definitive break. What do I mean? I understand that we live in a country in which politics plays a very, very important part. But we must first get used to the idea of our political history. We don't have the same political history, not in this country. We never had the same political history. Oh, we had the same political experiences in a way. But we also have a very distinct political history, many millions of us in the United States. The average Native American's political history does not at all resemble what people generally call political history. Not at all. The Native American narrative is far different from the American narrative. because their experiences have been different. The consequences of European intervention in this part of the world brought an entirely different range of consequences for the original peoples. So only if they've lost their mind collectively, can we agree that their history is American history and a shared history? No. What we call American history, we must always remember, what we call American history is the European experience in the Americas. And the consequences of the European presence in the Americas. And like any conqueror, their history is imposed on everybody else and it becomes our history. And that is an essential political fight that we must have. And I'm thinking that the date is long overdue. I don't care about whether they recognize it or not. I care, though, that we don't seem to recognize it. We, the oppressed people. We don't seem to recognize that we have two entirely different ideas 
of what it means to be American. We have many different interpretations that are different from the standard interpretation of American history. We have entirely different experiences originating primarily in the intersection, if I'm being very nice about it, the intersection, the interplay between conquerors and those conquered. We always forget that this is a country that directly emerged from that very straightforward and undeniable narrative. This country was born in the crucible of conquest. And what we see today playing out before us as party politics, Democrats versus Republicans and so forth. This, this, has, this drama has played itself out over many, many decades. But we still see the vestiges, the direct consequences of conquest. Everything is shaped by it. Whether people choose to claim it or not is really none of our business. And we are not supposed to be waiting until people fully understand it. It is important, however, that we understand it. We who believe ourselves to be part of the oppressed in this country, we we have a duty to understand it and understand it well. Because in understanding it, hopefully, we fashion a response to it because the intent, the original intent was genocidal. Need I remind you? The original intent was not to live peacefully with the people they met here. The original intent was to wipe them out. That's what conquerors do. But we somehow have bought into their myth, their fantasy, their lies, their propaganda, that, you know, that perversion of the Rodney King question, can't we all just get along? Well, it's kind of hard to get along with this with this gunshot in my head. It's hard to get along with my family destroyed. It's hard to get along being locked out of what I need to make a living and to survive. It's hard to get along when you are making the rules that I must live by. And in those rules, there's nothing that suggests that you understand this world to be one in which we all should share equally. We all should have reasonably equal access to the strategic resources of this society. You don't get that. In fact, you emphatically state it and restate it all the time. You've created classes, you've created all kinds of means of distinguishing between and among people on all kinds of strange grounds, the color of your skin, what your last name is, what kinds of foods you eat that suggest your culture. whether we can trust you to obey us 
and to do exactly what we intend to do with you, to cooperate with your own oppression. Now, I'm not being facetious, but it does sound that way, doesn't it? It does sound unbelievable, doesn't it? That millions and millions of people would find themselves in a situation where they do not nearly realize the fix that they're in, nor do they realize the potential they have to overcome obstacles. If, if we all understood our inherent and innate power, and if we are to believe the rulers, the constitutional rights we have to pursue our interests, to pursue freedom and happiness just like anybody else. Because the truth is, we are not like anybody else. We are conquered people. And we ought to have that understood among ourselves. We don't seem to understand it. We don't seem to receive it. But the people who are running things, that's the first thing they are taught. That they are in charge. Their first duty is to maintain that power relationship and power equation. They're not to encourage what we loosely call democracy. They're not to encourage equality. <laughs> not at all. They're working on the basis of a long uh, written formula. Formula is that forever and ever, on the basis of skin privilege and skin color and all other kinds of variables associated with that, that is the power arrangement in the United States. And it does not to change. No white person in this country has a need or feels a need to engage in a struggle for freedom. They understand that they have it. It comes with the power arrangement in this country. Of course, we have many examples on the historical record of whites who spurned that equation because they believed it does not nearly represent the real intention of the word equality or democracy or freedom. We have many examples of people discarding the automatic privileges that come with white skin. But the root of a problem here is that we just don't seem to understand. We just don't seem to get it. Where we are, black, white, and polka dot alike, where we are in this country, based on these outrageous concepts, why do we have them? Why do they stand? Why do we regard them as legitimate? And even to the point of participating in the farce of voting, because none of it has anything to do with democracy. You're asking people subjected to unequal treatment for centuries to endorse your sick, warped idea of how this country should be run. And then you call it democratic. So 
I'm making the case that we don't need to waste time. Let's not, let's not waste any time. Let's get to it. Let's understand what the challenge is before us and get to it. Let's not play their game, which is being played on us. Let's not do that anymore. Let's stop the charade. And let's come to terms with the fearsome fact that our futures have already been planned. And what is happening in the guise of elections and democratic reforms and all that other jargon is that slowly, almost imperceptibly, we are moving toward a predictable end. We are moving right back into the, we, we herded back into where we were. You look at it. I mean, take some time. This is the reason I'm talking to you. Take some time and look at it. And tell me whether in, since the 1950s, and I'm being modest here, I'm not going all the way back, going from the 1950s to now, do you not see the pattern? Do you not see that there has been really no progress or very little progress and it's tantamount to no progress in half a century? And in all that time, they're telling you, look, progress means that you can vote without you studying what that means. You can vote for your own annihilation. Yes, you can. In this great democracy. You're voting, but your children in 2019 are going to schools that are underperforming those schools, the community-run schools of the 1800s. Yes, you have a job. If you're lucky, you have a job that could actually help you pay your bills. But since when is this supposed to be a gift? This is supposed to be a right. This is why you're voting. You're voting for the allocation of resources, your tax dollars. Look, Trump and his family used your tax dollars to go see the queen for their own good and their own purposes. Had nothing to do with you. The last thing that crossed their mind were the people who funded their wonderful and glorious trip. We've got to come to terms with the ugliness and the reality of our shared condition. We have to deal with it. And as I say, this may not be their politics, meaning the, the privileged, the well-to-do, and the, the, the intractable whites of America. This is not their politics. This is our politics. And we've neglected our politics for a long time. Look at the consequences. Can we continue in this direction and still hold, out, hold on to the hope that things will get better? They're not going to get better. They're not designed to get better. Little by little, we can see, even just in the short time, that 
Donald Trump has been president of the United States. You see a dramatic and measurable and calculable change in the mentality and the attitude of white America. You can see it. You can feel it. We know who the targets are. We should stop pretending. We are back to the primordial equation of we have white conquerors and everybody else is subject to being conquered. That's, that's the equation. That's the power equation we're dealing with. So let me take a break, and we'll come back right after it for some more of this, if you could stand it. <laughs> okay, see you soon. Listening to Lead Stories on PRN.FM. I'm Utrice Lead. As I mentioned at the start of the program, we've just moved and things are still being worked on, one of them being our phone system. Uh, I've been advised today that uh, it should be up and running by Monday. They had quite a few things to work out there, and that's the telephone company I'm talking about. Uh, so we'll continue. We'll continue. I want you, though, as we listen to make notes, because we are going to have some serious talking to do and some serious thinking to do, because we are in a very serious state. And, uh, at this point, in my view, all alarms should be going off continuously, warning us of the inevitability of total conquest if we don't do something quickly. The answer, I believe, this is just my theory, this is just my, my thinking, is that the one sure thing that can save us is community. It is the one thing that this system relentlessly has gone after, fragmenting communities, annihilating communities, destroying communities, underfunding communities, reallocating the resources of our communities to preferred communities. But in any event, it's destruction we're talking about. It is expressed in many ways. We have our communities systematically being emptied. It used to be called urban renewal, where the promise was, we're going to build you a better community. No, but first we're going to have to break down this one in order to build you a new one. The new ones never did come. And the ones that they put in place were simply gulags, temporary housing, because they knew that this was not long-term planning. And then, through the enforcement of other crazy laws, and through the inequitable funding, tax levied funding and other schemes to target vulnerable communities, we find that, in fact, we have deserts where there used to be communities. And the good thing about communities, however people seem to 
to interpret that. I see communities as an excellent line of defense if they're working well. Defense and survival. And I'm talking about community. I'm not talking about a neighborhood where a bunch of people are living in the same square uh, uh, area, square block. That's not a community. I'm talking about an area in which, well, not really an area. I don't want you to think it's all about a geographic area. Community is the establishment of links, vital links that sustain life. So you could be living in Bedford-Stuyvesant and identify your community in Baltimore. It's still community. It still sustains life. It still helps you in terms of navigating this, this maze that we are faced with every day. We must revive this idea, this reality of community. It is about bringing back those things that sustain you, your culture, your ideas, your accomplishments, your goals, the things you do for yourself that would go beyond yourself. You know, it blew my mind when I first came to New York and attended Erasmus Hall High School. I was forced to attend Erasmus Hall High School, even though the evaluator admitted I was overqualified. I was ready for college. But ordered back to high school. And one day I was really down. And I walked around the corner just to look at the block, the neighborhood that Erasmus Hall was in. And lo and behold, there was a building. And it was a, quote, colored school, unquote. A colored school. In the big, brave United States, a colored school. Even though it was intended, of course, to take the children of promise from a community and systematically dumb them down and systematically uh, cut off any, any, uh, connection they might have to a better life through better education. The idea was you corral them, which gives you, the conqueror, a greater sense of security, a greater sense of superiority. You're not polluted. But I was thinking what a great thing it was. Because right there, I'm looking at people who had to deal with this every day as a way of survival in a country that had no use for them and therefore made no real accommodations for them. They were forced to have to do something and this was what they were willing to do as a temporary fix. Even so, It was a victory, a victory. Even today, many people who came through that era 
of racial segregation and educational segregation cherish the values they learned in these so-called colored schools. Why? Because somehow cultural memory, cultural values were key to their everyday survival. They observed a different kind of life in these schools based on their cultural history, based on their genetic cultural history. Isn't that odd? And right around the corner was a school that accommodated Europeans, Norwegians, Scandinavians, Germans, Irish children, Jewish children. In great America, and people thought, well, there's going to be no consequence to this. And so it was the general thinking. I'm saying, though, that there is evidence. There's enough evidence to show that many people held on to their values, held on to their culture, held on to these things despite the price that they had to pay every single day because what was thought to be a punishment actually galvanized their building of community, their sense of community. And this is a strength. It was not intended to be a strength, but it should be utilized as a strength. It sustained us, and we have to return to it and respect it and cultivate it again. Because based on what we see being devised for us as, as a collective, we have to understand the reality that we are facing, which is called annihilation. And I don't mean to be pessimistic and, and you know, the bearer of bad news. I'm telling you, and you know it innately, that that is the goal. The question is, how do we use our political strength now, our political knowledge now? How do we prepare to protect our interests and our collective lives in this country? It's not a doomsday, it's not a doomsday question. Not at all. It's a reality-based question. If you're paying attention, even cursory attention, you can't doubt what you're seeing. You can't doubt what is happening. You can't still question whether this is truly what is meant for us. Yes, it is. It's, just, it's, it's, it's real. It's a, it's a real question. And the answer is yes. This is what is intended. And so we should not be wasting time uh, arguing th political theory and, uh, you know, uh, all of this frivolous stuff because our lives are at stake, literally. Our future is at stake, literally. We cannot devote any substantial amount of time to wondering if this is truly intended. Yes, it is truly intended. And we have to deal with that as our reality. And we can't lose sight of it, not for one minute. We ought to be in serious planning mode. We ought to be talking about this in our communities. 
we ought to be sounding the alarm because we don't have much time to devise some kind of antidote, some kind of defense against what is planned and what will be enacted in service of actually destroying our communities and ourselves. This is not, to me, a, a, uh, a frivolous matter. This is an urgency. We need to reconstruct community and not just physical community. We need to have a series of connected dots all over this country where people are seeing the same thing. They're having the same experience. They're having the same dismal outcomes. This can't be accidental. It never has been accidental. Not in our experience. And some people would say, well, you know, why are you, why are you folks so doomsday oriented? Why can't you just lift yourselves up by your own bootstraps? You know that phrase that gets you so irritable when, when people say it. Lift yourselves up by your own bootstraps. We don't have time for people who can't think anymore or who refuse to see what is in front of us. What I mean is construct community. Construct community. As you know, I was in New York recently. I gave a talk at the community church in Manhattan about this very subject. And for the one day that I was in New York and just riding to my destination, it was like a, a nightmare when I studied the landscape and I could see with my own eyes, the evidence of the progress that is being made in emptying, totally emptying communities, replacing them with more desirable residents. Beautiful buildings that have been left to rot. The total transformation of communities preparing for people who never lived there. The abandonment of things that meant so much to the short time I lived in New York, uh, 20, 30 years. But nothing looked the way, not even remotely looked the way I expected it to look. And I said to myself, would any other community tolerate this? And why is it that these communities that I was observing, why is it that they were tolerating these changes and seemed to be adapting to them? There seemed to be no fight left. Although it is clear that the battle already seems to be mostly lost. But look, we have a chance and we must take it. We have to fight for ourselves, fight for our survival. And the, the best protection we have the surest protection that we have, the greatest protection that we have, I say, is in reconstituting, 
rebuilding, reclaiming our community in every sense of the word, economically, politically, job-wise, the inherent pride we had, and the culture that sustained us. These things we can depend upon again, and we must revive these things so that they continue to play important roles in our continued survival. And in the end, that is the best we can hope for. And it is attainable, but we have to put our minds to it. I want to thank you profoundly and sincerely for supporting the idea of this program, which is to encourage people to think, especially those people who have been encouraged not to think, or who have been told not to think, or who have been told what to think. Bring yourself to it. Look at the evidence for yourself. Judge for yourself what the right decision is. And join in, in an effort wherever you can, however you can, to do the one thing that could save us all, which is reclaim and rebuild community. Thanks so much for listening. I'm sorry that we weren't able to talk to each other today, but we'll get there sooner than you know. We'll talk again tomorrow for Your Mind Friday. Bye-bye.